for coming, everybody. You good? I am very happy to introduce Mark Sprang. He is an archivist from Historical Collections of the Great Lakes from BGSU, those not from the Midwest, that's Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Mark is a U of M grad of information. So, yes, blue. Um, Mark was here a few years ago before COVID. What's that? It was like 2019 or 2018? That, yeah. I don't even know. Anymore. It was before COVID. Was we forget. So, so, very interesting stuff. We're really happy to have him back. Uh, with that, take it away. All right. Yeah, we have a good crowd again. Last time they had catered Chinese food, so I'm feeling kind of let down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. BGSU is uh, about 20 miles south of Toledo. It's an hour and 10 minute straight shot from here to there because we literally butt up against I-75. So it's like, if you get lost, it's your own fault. It's not like Ann Arbor where the streets just kind of go wherever they want. So we're one of those boring Midwest square cities that are all on the grid. Um, so you might be wondering, now if you don't know, but yeah, we're right, right there. That's probably what it looks like right now, actually, from space. Um, that's a NASA image from 2018, I believe. Um, you may be wondering, Mark, Bowling Green, if you know it, is landlocked. There's no river, there's no creeks, there's no lakes. Why do we have a, marit a huge maritime collection? Well, our collection founder was a Great Lakes nut from when he was a little kid. He got his doctorate from Kent State in Ohio. Uh, in 1968, and back then, you could get a tenure track position at 28 years old, which he did uh, at BGSU. Can I you something? Oh, sure, sure. A little quiet in the back there. Okay, thanks for letting me know. And just uh, clip that guy. Thanks. It's the mask, I think. I'm not used to This is the first in-person presentation I've done since 2019, so it's like... Um, but yeah, Dr. Wright was like a Great Lakes nut. He was collecting uh, pictures, uh, architectural drawings. Um, there was a shipping comp shipbuilding company in Chicago going out of business in the early 60s. So he was about 22 and someone called him and they're like, hey, Rick, they're going to throw all it away. You need to go to Chicago. So he literally like rented a truck and just drove to Chicago and took all the corporate records out before they tossed it. Um, so that so his sort of personal collection of books, um, rare items became sort of the core of the collection. And it's grown a lot since then. So I brought some example drawings for everyone to look at afterward, but we have about about 2200 tubes of these like this. Uh, most of the vessels are like 1880s to 1980. And then there's a handful from before that. Um, that's probably the biggest chunk of the collection other than photographs, about 130,000 of those. But most of the people that come to me with questions about naval architectural records are model builders, they're scale model builders. Most of the time they do it for fun or someone asks them to do it. And more often than not, they're retired engineers, surprise. <laughs> so they have good experience with that. Um, but we also have lots of rare books, some a few audio recordings, films, things like that. Um, but I'll go to the more part. The first one I want to mention, this is just a really brief one. So Wilford Bartenfeld, uh, so he was a naval architect who had his own firm in Cleveland. Uh, he went from the 20s to the late 50s. And his expertise was repurposing civilian vessels for military use in World War II and then doing the other way around after the war. Um, so he has a lot of experience. Uh, and he was also an engineering officer and he also represented the Royal Navy uh, to Great Lakes shipbuilders during the war as well. So he had a lot of intimate knowledge of sort of the technical specs of military vessels at the time. Because Great Lakes, the size was uh, the size of vessels that they built were limited by the St. Lawrence Seaway had not been constructed yet. So all the vessels had to be, I'm trying to remember the limit back then, at least 250 feet, if not shorter. So most of the vessels built on the lakes were patrol crafts, submarine uh, chasers, frigates, tug, tons of tugs, minesweepers, uh, that sort of thing. And over in see, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, over there, uh, they built about three dozen submarines. Uh, so yeah, protecting the Great Lakes from the Canadian fleet. Um, but yeah, they actually shipped them down the Mississippi to be fitted out in New Orleans. So it's a really interesting thing. So they have a submarine museum there. It's not one of the boats that was built there, but it's the same class. 
And it's one, just like the USS Cod over in Cleveland, that's almost still in its original configuration. So it wasn't, it wasn't repurposed after the war. Another short one I just want to mention. So Pash Marine was in Erie, Pennsylvania from 1866 to 1980, and they specialized in craft under 100 feet. And they did a lot of pioneering work with aluminum after the war. Uh, I just actually got a phone call yesterday from the Maryland DNR. They have one of the tugs built there uh, 60 years ago that's still in service. Um, and also, so this is one of the old Mackinac Island ferries for Arnold Transit built in 1955. That's the sprinkler system layout. Uh, that's another one. I wish we, we only have the plans for about the 40s through the 60s and 70s. So I'm always wondering what happened to the rest of them. If the company started in 1860s with uh, German immigrants who came right from Kiel, Germany, which if you know anything about Germany, that's been their major shipbuilding center for 200 years and still is to this day. Yeah, so that's another, another angle of the Arnold Line Ferry. And then R.A. Stern, and this would be another brief one too, similar to the Bartenfeld, the first person I mentioned, he was really good and very experienced at repurposing civilian military vessels back and forth. Uh, for example, there was you know, a tank landing craft in World War II that was converted to a, a car ferry. Um, or a Liberty ship converted to a passenger liner, which is one of the weirder conversions to me. But one I wanna talk about more is uh, Loudon Wilson. I brought two of his uh, folders of his uh, sketches and drawings for you to look at. So he was a commercial artist in Detroit for an ad firm, but in his spare time, he loved Great Lakes vessels. I mean, he did some steamships like this, but he really loved sailing vessels. So there's a lot of very detailed information where he did lots of sketches, um, scale drawings based on models. And also since he did a lot of it in the 1920s, he uh, spoke with a lot of the retired, really, you know, the sailors in their last days who still remember when sailing vessels were in their heyday. So take some of his information with a grain of salt because he's talking to people who haven't been on a boat in 40 years, but um, it's, yeah, his sketches are just top notch. So he puts his art skills into it. Yeah, that's only about two and a half by two and a half in real life and it became a postage stamp which is really cool the british schooner enterprise used as a centennial stamp by the postal department it says so yeah he used pen for that but then he did other stuff in pencil other stuff in watercolor other stuff in ink so very versatile a lot of people when they're in art they're in like there's a specific medium that they use the most but he decided to just do whatever anything works that's another ink drawing yeah, so in the color that he gets is just amazing. Um, and the level of detail that he's able to get in there is just fantastic. Yeah, there's one of his his sketches. So his some of them are really rough, and then some of them are just, you know, the, the scale is great. And he the detail and the amount of technical information he has on sailing vessels on the Great Lakes specifically is really top notch. So I use it a lot uh, from people who were doing shipwreck hunting. Um, that's a decent portion of my clientele, but also someone who is writing like a historical romance novel, like set on Great Lake schooners, I think in the 1870s. And she, you know, the captain's daughter falls in love with the innocent deckhand. And <laughs> I'll note that it's Christian historical fiction. So everything's above board, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, I like. There's some of these drawings and his notes he originally wanted to put into a book, but he, he passed away before that could happen. So we still have all of his sort of subject notebooks and his handwritten stuff that he did. Um, you know, like, I like this. The bowsprit and jibboon ringing for the Lyman Davis, but he mentions, I was at Toronto in April 1934, and it was there, and I talked to somebody who knew was also on the boat, basically. Sometimes I'll add little notes. Hey, I talked to Captain so-and-so, and he said, actually, it's like this. He really, in the very beginning of his notes, he actually credits all of the former sailors that he talked to. So if it was a, if we ever, I ever make it a book someday, I'd make sure I put all those in the acknowledgements. Um, and he really liked drawing the, the sterns, the transoms of the, the sailing vessels because they were often very colorful and decorated. And you really miss out on that with uh, black and white. The closest you can get to that now is going down to like your local marina or yacht club and checking out the sterns of all the yachts there and see 
you know, what people did with it. Um, yeah, I like this one as well. These were schooners specifically designed for wood, and he likes to indicate how they're different. Like this one has two, he notes it says, notes that there's two spreaders here. This one only has one or has none. That's one of my favorite ones because he went through and got so many different vessels, what the name was, where it was from, uh, and what year it looked like that. Because sailing vessels tended to be, this is sort of before, just like any industry, uh, shipping companies started in the 19th century and consolidated, and then there are only a handful now. But back then, it was like a family business. You owned the boat, you were the captain of the boat, you got your friends and family to staff the boat, you got your wife and or daughter and or sister to be the cook so you didn't have to pay her to do anything. So that's the way it operated back then. I did. I have a separate talk just on women on the sailing ships, and it's quite a quite a thing. Um, but I, yeah, I like the just the beautiful amount of work that he took into those. Um, and the closest you can get to being on one is way up in Alpena at Thunder Bay Marine Sanctuary. They have a museum there and they have a half replica of one of these sailing ships. And the instant you walk into it, it angles you about 20 degrees because that's what it was usually doing. The bunks are about the size of this table, just slightly longer. And then um, there's just a wood stove. So that's how they knew if you were the noob cook because you didn't have any burns on you yet from falling into it. Um, yeah. The, the, the crew expects fresh biscuits at 6 a.m. So you have to make everything from scratch on this tipping boat. Yeah, it's a whole, I could talk all day just about that because it's amazing. And as a side note, uh, this actually works. Great Lakes sailors usually got much better food than ocean sailors at the time because you were, you were always close to shore and were only at sea a few days at a time. So you always had fresh fish in the water. You had fresh produce and stuff as opposed to out in the middle of the ocean where you're eating salted pork and hardtack and reconstituted cod and all kinds of great stuff. So there's the dining room. You've got uh, oil lamp, two more oil lamps. Yep, you have a woman serving them, of course. Everybody has a mustache because everybody had a mustache mm -hmm. and real china and silver service. And then usually the, the room was coated with uh, very finely stained and oiled wood, which surprise is a fire hazard. <laughs> There's a number of these boats that burned to the water line when they were at dock because a lamp fell over or someone spilled something on it. Or in one case, the captain tried to shoot someone and his gun misfired and said it burned his boat down, which I guess he deserved for that because it was it was his sister. So <laughs> and here's what you do on deck when you're just sailing. So yeah, you've got actually you've got another woman there and they're just singing and playing songs. I like these little sketches. A lot of these were sort of slice of life things where he sketched what he saw. But I like this one because I mean, look all the every little chain link, every little shadow. Yeah, it's really it's about as close as you can get to imagining what it's like to be on one of these vessels. This is the biggest collection I want to talk about. So yeah, American Shipbuilding Company or Amship. Um, at their peak, they had. Let me go back to here so we can see. So they had shipyards in Buffalo, Cleveland, Lorraine, Toledo, Bay City. Chicago and Superior, Wisconsin. They formed in 1899 because in the 1890s, there were at this point, there were so many ship shipbuilders that were so competitive that everyone was dropping their prices so low that no one was making any margin anymore. So a few, a few of those yards got together in New York City, of all places, um, said, hey, why don't we secretly form our own company and then we'll drop, we'll dump it on everybody else in the industry when we're done which they did, and they bought and leased out several other yards around the entire uh, Great Lakes. So this is definitely the biggest, there's about 2,000 tubes of drawings just for this company. So they formed in 1899, their last, U, or last US or Great Lakes built vessel was in 1981. They moved to Tampa and went out of business because they were having trouble with the union, so they left. And the economy was just awful at that point, so they weren't making any money. So they built a lot of different kinds of vessels. That's the Marquette and Vesper number two. It's a car ferry for train cars, not automobiles. So I had two rows of train tracks inside. It would back up to the dock and then a locomotive would back the train cars up to it. And then it would take it across the lake. In this case, it would go across from Northeast Ohio to Canada. There was another huge company, actually the Ann Arbor Railroad that did that across Lake Michigan. They go, they get the, the uh, iron ore from the UP in Minnesota. They bring it to Wisconsin, take it across 
the lake on the car ferries and then go down to the industrial areas of in Michigan and Ohio. But that way they avoided having to go through Chicago. Because even if, if you've driven through Chicago, you know how awful that is now. Now imagine doing it on trains and everything is covered in Colsa and you can't, you're like, you can feel the emphysema. So, so I want you, this is the same boat. So there's gonna be a few interactive questions on this one. They're most, they're pretty easy. I mean, this one, I want you to look at the back of that boat where they would back train cars full of stuff into them. Does it look like there's a major design flaw on this boat? Shouldn't there be something here? There's no gate. So that's why in 1909, this ship sank and everybody died and they still haven't found it in Lake Erie of all places. 33 sailors went down with it. Um, that was 1909. Another one happened in 1910. And so finally they said, yeah, maybe we should put gates on. Um, because basically what happened, at least with this one, was they think it was because it was probably it was going south. So they're thinking once once you had a couple of waves come in the back, just enough that the train cars start to slide, and then it. So three three car ferries were actually lost in the Great Lakes that way. There was another one lost in Lake Michigan that I helped someone find the wreck this past summer actually, and it's still at a thirty degree angle like this, sticking out of the bottom because the train cars all went to the back and just. So yeah, major design flaw, but it's interesting because they have a pilot house on the back too for when they backed up to the dock. So always put a gate on your boat. Very good. That's another picture. I love it because it's all ice and the ice is exploding as the ship goes past it, which seems really cool. And it's hard to believe there used to be that much ice on the whole Great Lakes. Well, there still is now, but it's nothing like it used to be where basically if you sailed up until about the 1890s, you couldn't even get underwriters insurance after November 30th because it was too dangerous. Another unique design were railbacks. They built them up in Superior, Wisconsin. So the hull is, cylind is cylindrical. Um, so it, lies, it has very low freeboard, um, but it was surprisingly seaworthy. Mostly they just went out of favor in the 19 teens or so because they just weren't big enough anymore. And the hatches were too small for modern equipment to unload the cargo. So they had to either use old equipment or do it by hand, which that's how they used to do the oldest freighters as just guys with wheelbarrows had to go in and scoop out, you know, 900 tons of coal. <sighs> yeah, it was, it's all hard labor. <laughs> that's a cabin plan for the Joseph Colby, which is one of them. They call them steam barges, but they also gave them names. Not always, but these are my favorites, the huge passenger boats. So before the Model T really took off, this was, other than trains, this was the way to travel. Uh, yeah, that's the SSCNB, creatively named because it's the Cleveland and Buffalo Transit Company, C and B. Yeah, they're really creative. Um, this one was one of three liners, I think, that were at least 500 feet long, five decks, you know, 1,200 passengers. It's pretty amazing. You could go from, there was Cleveland and Buffalo and Detroit and Cleveland. And you could go from Detroit to Cleveland in eight hours, which back then was pretty awesome because uh, you couldn't drive your car that far, even if you had one, because there weren't, we didn't have the infrastructure built out yet. So this was still, and you usually went on the evening. So you got on, you had a luxury dinner, dancing, you passed out probably from alcohol because most people drank back then. And then you woke up, you're like, oh, I'm in Cleveland, dude. <laughs> so that's pretty much how it worked. <laughs> It's really, they made it sort of a whole experience versus we're so used to just being able to get from point A to point B now. So they tried to make it a whole luxury thing. And farther on, they added space so that you the, the first class passengers could also bring their vehicles. But that was also back when Buffalo was a hot vacation destination. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Uh, didn't that uh, CNB get turned into some kind of training platform? You did, it, we did. That's actually the next quiz question. So there's the interior of the salon. That's three decks high and about 300 feet long. So that's a um, pastel painting on the ceiling there. It's hard to see, but it's supposed to mimic like if you were down in the cargo hold of a ship during like the Elizabethan era. So they got like the fluttering flags and all that. This is all electrical lighting. Well, they started with, they almost, they almost went to gasp. They're like, you know, we've had too many fires on these wooden boats. So they put in electrical lighting. So it was, Everything was just top notch. And I wish I could see that in color because the, the American shipbuilding hired a professional photographer to come in when they were finished before the first passengers come on so they could get 
you know, perfect pictures of it before it's been scratched and dented by the passengers. Uh, yeah, that's the, I think that's the men's smoking room. They had, they had separate smoking rooms for men and women. Because I guess smoke affects us differently. <clears throat> that's uh, inlaid glass in the ceiling and here. Yeah, I love the passenger liners, not just because of the, like their deck plans, but also they often had plans just for some of the, for this specific one, there was a naval architect working with an interior designer together. So they got, they got free reign. The architect said, I'll do, you know, all the technical stuff. You do all the aesthetics yourself. And this is part of a, a it's a thing that folds out to like three by four, but it folds down to eight and a half by 11 cruise pamphlet from the thirties. I had to guess based on the, what they were wearing. So they got all these, just like now you get all these great stock photos. Like when you go on the university website, like, oh yes, we're all this happy all the time when we're here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you can go on a seven day cruise on the Great Lakes for $60, or if you want your own bathroom, 60 or $60 or 66, if you wanted your own toilet. Um, that was pretty revolutionary at the time. Yeah, that's really hard to see, but there's like, there's the dance hall. There's that smoking room we just saw. They had a captain's masquerade, shuffleboard. They brought um, like swing bands and like vaudeville groups on board to do it. Um, I think that's the women's sitting room. And then there was also a writing room. So that's, you had to go to the specific room to write your, your postcards and letters that you dropped off at each stop. Um, yeah, there we go. There's the boat. And they always made it look longer in the picture than it really was. Like there's this one poster where it just keeps going. It's like infinity boat where you can't literally, you literally can't see the end of it, but this is all the deck plans. And it was a big deal because this was the first liner on the great lakes where every room had a phone where you could call the other rooms. So you could like coordinate be like, Hey, we're going down to the bar. You want to go? Yeah, let's go. Or, um, <clears throat> or also to call room service, of course. Um, I mean, most of the menus from this time, we have a few of the dining menus and I'm like, I don't know what half of this is. And I had to Google it because I'm like, I don't know what these dishes are. And some of it sounded really bad, but there was even, even the cocktails. I'm like, this is beyond Mad Men. This stuff is awful. <laughs> Anything with vermouth and absinthe is a no-go, but absinthe was huge in the twenties. This was built in 1913. So yeah, it's like hand sanitizer for your insides. <laughs> okay. So now we're getting to the quiz question. We've got someone guarding the ship. They're tearing all that beautiful deck work off. So be creative. What do you think it became for World War II? Not a troop ship, I can tell you that. He's very close. Any guesses? Yes. Who said aircraft carrier? Yep, you got it. Boom, look at that. <laughs> so those, those four smokestacks are now in the island. And they made a wooden deck. So they were, there was another one called the, uh, this became the USS Sable. And there was another one, the Greater Buffalo, or not became the USS Sable. CMB came to USS Wolverine. So they were the only two paddle wheel aircraft carriers in the Navy. <laughs> so they sent them to Chicago at Navy Pier. That's why it's called Navy Pier. Surprise. Um, and that's where they did uh, carrier aviation training it was way safer than doing it in the Pacific. So they went out into Lake Michigan to do it. So lots of people like George Bush and people were trained there, about 30,000 pilots, I think, altogether. But this did not have arrestor wires on it. So there are several dozen nice aircraft wrecks in Lake Michigan and the fresh water preserves them. So they've been a boon for people wanting to rebuild World War II planes because there's Wildcats and Avengers and all kinds of planes at the bottom of Lake Michigan that they can rebuild. Yeah, that's crazy. And then 1947, scrapped it. The passenger business was going downhill after the war because everyone was buying cars. They started building the interstate freeway system. Then air travel got cheaper. And so the boats were like, well, we can't compete with, you know, going to St. Thomas or someplace or Miami Beach, Myrtle Beach, God forbid. Um, sorry, I lived in South Carolina for a couple of years. So <laughs> that's like that's like their low class vacation destination. <laughs> And then they built, this is the first freighter built after World War II on the Great Lakes, the Wilfred Sykes. So it kind of set a new standard for luxury, as luxurious as a cargo ship can be. Um, and it's still in service. It launched in 1949 because there was so, so much excess tonnage left over from the war that there were several boats that were brought in from the ocean to be repurposed for Great Lakes service. And you can easily tell them apart because they have the 
ocean going narrow sharp bow and the great lakes freighters are much more rounded like that because the conditions are so much different yeah there's the launch i'd love to be these people like up here while the boat is sliding sideways into the water <clears throat> i think it'd be fun yeah there's that it's the service there's how much smoke there used to be and it was it was such a big deal for people that it toured cities around the lakes and people lined up for hours just to go look at it like go inside and see it closest you can get to going on one of these is uh there's a museum freighter in toledo that's about 600 feet long built in 1911 that you can go on and you actually see it which is pretty neat but yeah it's mind-blowing to think that people were like if this happened today i'm like yeah some people would go but it wouldn't be like this it's kind of like if any of you know the john mulaney bit where he's talking about like when people used to just go to wave at ships as they left <laughs> yeah it's kind of like that where it's like you want to go see the ship leave no i don't know anyone on a ship and you just swing your handkerchief until it's over the horizon so people were yeah all the launches were huge and now it's like okay we got some people but it was like a community event sometimes that people would go everywhere you see people sitting on the scaffolding and on the cranes and now just mentioned there's 13 1000 footers on the great lakes they're stuck here because they're 250 feet over the seaway limit so they can carry about 70,000 tons uh so it can carry about three of these in one and they're 105 feet across and i believe they only have like a foot of clearance on each side in the canal or the locks at sault st marie so you need to be they have very very skilled pilots and helmsmen for that um <clears throat> So Great Lakes Engineering Works was another shipyard. It went out of business in 62, but American Shipbuilding bought like their plans morgue and all of their stuff. So that's how we have it now. Um, so the Edmund Fitzgerald, of course, that's their most famous boat that they built. They did some others, like they built a fancy yacht for the, the Dodge automotive family. But of course, Dodge died before he could use it, um, which that, as a side note, that yacht is still in service. It was built in the 20s. You can rent it. Uh, I went on a rabbit hole of luxury yacht rentals because I know it would cost like a year of my pay for like one day. Um, so I think that's the one you can rent for about 50 grand a day. And you can bring about 10 people with you, but it's Eastern Mediterranean. So they go to Cyprus, Crete, they skip Lebanon right now, uh, Tel Aviv, Cairo, like Mykonos. Yeah, it's crazy, but you get a crew. So there's that only $50,000. So both of them and American shipbuilding money made bank during World War One because the United States Shipping Board produced a standard set of freighter designs and had everyone build them. So about 400 or so were built on the lakes and they got sold everywhere <laughs> after the war. So for example, there's several that were sold to Japan after the war and then we sunk them in World War II. There's several that were like, for example, this one, the Cotopaxi was lost between Charleston, South Carolina and Havana. Uh, I've been helping a group of people trying to find it. If you've ever seen the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that's the boat they find in the desert at the beginning. It's actually this one because it was the Bermuda Triangle where it was lost. That's not a real thing, by the way. It just seems that way. So yeah, this is it at dock in South America. But yeah, they may just, they were doing so great. And then just had to, and the biggest problem actually was the, they would get their skilled workers trained up, all their blue collar workers, and then they would get drafted. So we have like this folders of correspondence where they're just like frantically sending letters and telegrams and phone calls to the federal government being like, stop taking our workers. They're technically helping the war effort. Like we get them all trained for after several months and then you're like, we're taking them. <clears throat> yeah, these are some a small fold out versions of the Edmund Fitzgerald plans. Actually, I had a, when I was here before, I actually had students ask me for this a couple of weeks after I was here. <laughs> so they were doing a paper on the Edmund Fitzgerald, I think. So that's just the most famous one. I mean, it was 1975, everyone was lost. Like there's a really long song about it, really long song about it. <laughs> but there's, depending on the size of vessel you include, there's around 6,000 wrecks altogether in the Great Lakes. So this is just, and there were, there were several other large ones within 10 years of this one. This one just gets all the fame. Kind of like the Titanic, like how many shipwrecks are there in the oceans? But everyone knows the Titanic. But I didn't want to talk at you for an hour and a half because I wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions and also to take time to look at the things that I brought. Um, make sure I didn't miss anything.
Ending note on the Fitzgerald, it was such a, it was the biggest ship built on the lakes at that point at 728 feet long that 15,000 people came to the launch. That's mind blowing. I can't imagine that many people ever going to a ship launch now. Does anybody have any questions for me? I'll answer anything and then take plenty of time to look at the original things I brought and eat, of course. I did the short, a little bit shorter form this time. Is there a one piece of the collection that kind of stands out as like the holy grail? Yeah, there's a couple of items I think would count. Um, one of them's because we don't just do maritime history. There's also Native American history, environmental history, because we have this whole the whole legacy of the industry that built this region. Now there's the fallout from that. I mean. Um, but actually one item we have, someone just donated last year. So it's a handwritten letter from the 1850s from a, a missionary up in the Upper Peninsula. I thought that was really interesting. Um, but also our oldest, I think it's probably our oldest architectural drawing. I of course didn't bring that. It's from 1867. So it's very, very old. A lot of times before that, there were so many mom and pop shipyard shipbuilders that would just, it was all in their head that they could do it all in their heads because sometimes they weren't even literate but they could build a ship just from this, which is mind blowing. I think that one would, that's definitely one of them. And the, I think the Loudon Wilson collection too, just because of like the, all the intimate knowledge of this, he kind of bridges like the 19th century and the 20th century. So kind of talking to people who were experiencing the transition in the shipping industry from sale to steam and then, and documenting that for posterity. Sure. How much are this collection worth? <laughs> See, that's tricky because the university wants you to insure it. But it's like, yeah, we'd get money, but we can't get the stuff back. So I know, for example, like as archivists, one of our professional tenets is that we're not allowed to provide financial uh, appraisals for people. Um, you have to find like a, you know, expert in the field to do that, which I guess we technically could be too, but, um, so it makes it really have to just come up with like, there's guidance in like archival, archival community to do that, but it's really, really hard because I mean, if it's something on microfilm or if it, they're copies of originals, or if they're digitized from somewhere else, yeah, microfilm, you can easily replace that, but stuff like this, I mean, where would you get it? Yeah. That's the hard part is. We do have one collection. It's a, a marine artist. It's all of his sketches, like the practice ones before the painting, and that was that was valued at two hundred thousand. But that's like three hundred drawings. But so many of it, it's like, how do you? The best the best you could do is like some books and things that are really rare. You could easily price those at least. So you do have about two to three thousand books. Several of them are pretty rare. So especially early ones on early vessel design someone finally decided to write down what everyone had in their head. It's the way it worked. So besides engineering drawings, uh, do you guys have notes on like construction of these ships and all that like issues that happened? Yeah, for some. Um, the subject files for some of those and correspondence, uh, the original specs for a number of the boats. Um, and for a couple that had major accidents like there was one in Lorraine in the 70s called the Roger Blau that had a fire that killed four people in the engine area um so we have like this much reports of like the, the local fire marshals report and then the families who sued the company the ship American shipbuilding company it's all the stuff that their lawyers make copies of in the corporate offices like that kind of stuff that was that's the closest major one so we have for some but not others because it's that's the thing with corporations, unlike uh, a public entity like the university or state government, they don't have nearly as many restrictions or requirements on what they have to keep. So sometimes people will be like, well, why don't you have this? Or why don't you have this? They didn't keep it. That's frankly what happens. Um, so yeah, we do have for some of them, at least it just depends on the, it's, like with most of it, it depends on the hall. Do you like always get your like new drawings and stuff from museums or like stuff like that? Or have you ever found something like 
a garage sale or like a resale shop. All of the above. Um, so the American shipbuilding drawings, those came directly from American shipbuilding in the late eighties uh, as they were transferring their operations to Tampa. Um, they were trying to, we even have the flat files that they came in, which are like solid steel things from the fifties. Even each drawer weighs 20 pounds. They're massive. So we got rid of a bunch of those. Now. <laughs> um, so of course they promised a lot of money and they didn't give it to us because the company was going bankrupt because they were promising $200,000 in 1988, which is about 260 something now, I think. I used, if you ever need to find out how much money was worth, just Google CPI inflation calculator. That's the government's inflation calculator that goes from 1913 to present. I use that a lot because someone will be like, well, how much is that in current dollars? I'm like, a lot. Um, See, we've gotten them from some museums um, or the Great Lakes Engineering Works plans were bought by American Shipbuilding Company when that company went out of business. So we got those. Um, some people have just had them at home because they worked there or they ordered copies decades ago. So we don't, the originals may not exist, but copies of the plans do. So at least there's something. And on occasion, there's um, stuff we get from other museums, um, like the Wisconsin Maritime Museum over in Manitowoc. I actually have some drawings to send them because I have some ones from Manitowoc Shipbuilding Company and I want them to be back where they were built. Because um, we're in Northwest Ohio, not everybody in central Wisconsin is gonna come all the way over <laughs> for it. Um, and luckily we are setting up a photography station where I can digitize them much more quickly because otherwise we have to go to Toledo to the public library to use their scanner. And we only get to do it once a month. So it's like, it's a real thing because as I was telling him when I got here, there was the biggest plan I've had to deal with was 30 by 144. So the one I have on the table there is 10 feet long, so it doesn't fit. <laughs> but it's that it's one of those same passenger vessels, big passenger vessels I mentioned. That was really popular last time, so I wanted to bring it, bring it back. But I have another donation coming of someone who used to work at the company that they said, oh, they were gonna throw it all away, so I just took it all home. <laughs> That's what happens. And now then it gets generations later and people either don't know if it's worth anything, so they'll pitch it or they'll ask someone or they're not interested in it. So it's just like anybody, you've inherit a collection of stuff from them and you're like, well, I don't really care about any of this. So usually it's people are trying to find a place for it to live. And you had a question too? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, um, does the archive uh, sell copies of the original or is that not allowed? Yeah, I mean, the companies are out of business, so no one cares anymore. <laughs> Um, because some of them I have the ones I brought are all ones I scanned already. So if anyone wants them, I can just send them a digital copy too. Um I wasn't gonna bring anything that I didn't scan first. <laughs> it's 70 miles is just long enough. And going from college town to college town, there's more opportunities for accidents. No offense to anyone here. So my insurance went up when I moved to a college town. So <laughs> so what happens? Um yeah, the only thing we usually charge for is someone's ordering a ton of them just for the time to do it. But most of the time it's not that it takes longer to piece them together in Photoshop than it does to actually scan them. Cause one like that you have to do in five sections. Then you have to photo merge it all one, like two pieces at a time. And the files are just massive. So only get a tip if you really want it. Any others? Did you uh, come across any examples of people doing like the ship calculations, like uh, stability or like structural? Yeah, sometimes. And oftentimes there are reports like um, a lot of them ended up being like presentations to SNAME or, you know, other because I mean, most of the naval architects who worked at a lot of these great like shipbuilding companies were trained here, which makes sense. Um, yeah, there's some and then Occasionally you'll see like someone will pencil something on the back of a plan or like on the edge or something. Um, you know, if there's revisions like, hey, we need to go back and do this. Although in the 19th century, it was more they launched it and then found out, oh, this thing's gonna tip over. We should probably go back and fix it and make it more stable because I'm trying to remember the ship that happened with, it was a passenger ship. It didn't, you know, tip over or anything, but they, they didn't rate it for the number of passengers. I'm like, how do you miss that? <laughs> Because so, yeah, it's stay, it's fine. Why don't you put four hundred people on it? It's not fine. <laughs> you got one. Curious if you've had anything in the collection related to like river going commerce, like on the Ohio River. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, canal boats. Um, and interesting enough, and like one of the newspapers we have the most of is the Toledo Blade. And back in the 19th century, they actually, well, most major city newspapers actually had a whole section called Marine News that had every boat, every boat that came and left, where it was going, where it was coming from, what it was carrying, who the captain was. And they did it for canal boats too. So they'd come up to Toledo on the, the canals from the Ohio River, and then they could get on the bigger ships to go out onto Lake Erie. Yeah, some and some on Illinois as well, because that was another tri good tributary for the Mississippi River. <clears throat> but that was a big deal because they uh, reversed the flow of the river at the turn of the century and then straightened the river, whereas Cleveland still looks like a snake. But Chicago straightened theirs and then made because it used to, the river used to flow into Lake Michigan, but they wanted it to flow backwards to carry the sewage away from Chicago to the poor sod south of the city because um, everyone dumped their sewage out back then. Um, I went, yeah, I mean, the public U.S. Public Health Service actually did a survey of the lakes in 19, the summer of 1913, published it in 1914. Plus they paid actually a public health doctor to do thousands of samples around all of the Great Lakes. And basically he's like, do not drink the water within 10 to 15 miles of any major city on the Great Lakes. The whole west end of Lake Erie is a no-go. Um, <clears throat> hence, we still have the algae boom problems on our part of the lake right here, because it never gets below about 40 to 50 feet, so it gets super warm, and then the algae grows because everything in our part of the state is made to drain into the lake. So then all, all the crap from the animals and from the farm fields goes into there, it makes algae. It's either 2013 or 14, the city of Toledo had to turn off their water intake for three days, so that's half a million people without water, because it was too toxic to drink. So, fun facts. Yep, I'm glad I get stuff from the river before it goes out there. But that's probably the rivers documented the most would be like the two, the canal, the Ohio canals, and then the um, the or the Calumet River there in Chicago. Oh, you already did one. He gets to do it now. What percentage of the collections have been digitized? Way less than I'd want because it's just me and a student. So, but I do tons of digitization on demand or if I'm doing research for someone and I see something cool, I'll just go scan it real quick because I'm like, yes. But for the, I mean, I think I have the plans for probably 20 or 30 vessels done and mainly they're profile drawings, line drawings, shell expansions, midship sections because it's the scale model builders. Um, that's pretty much who uses them the most. Um, and then the photographs, they're in, they're, you know, in folders by vessel. So I'll just do the whole folder if I'm already gonna be in it. So, cause that's what's get used the most, that and our huge collection of marine newspaper articles from the 19th, early 20th century. Cause it's mostly people writing articles or uh, shipwreck hunters more and more now because the technology's out there and affordable to do it. So like, I know someone my age, actually he's younger than me. He has a boat with an autopilot. He just sets a pattern to do side scan sonar and he controls his ROV with a PlayStation, a PS4 controller, like, and then looks at the camera with his phone. Like, it's amazing. Oh, you had another one, right? Oh yeah, I was just wondering, um, does the archive collect uh, uh, drawings from like smaller companies like Chris Craft or Starcraft or like Burger Yachts or something like that? I wish. Uh, we have a few from Defoe, which was in Bay City, Michigan. They built yachts. And then during the depression, they built luxury yachts. That tells you what kind of company it is. Uh, and then they survived on Navy contracts until they went out of business in the 70s. So mostly they built uh, destroyers, frigates, things like that. I wish we had more on the smaller smaller companies. I know they have some of it over in Wisconsin. Uh, and then I mentioned the Pash Marine Services, which used to be over here in Erie that built small craft. So there's such a, I mean, I had some knowledge of maritime history before I started this, but then finding out like the people who were diehard into it they're even worse than train guys. Like, no, actually, no. They told me train people are worse than boat people. Who people who are nuts for, for boats or trains and like to collect them and build models and fill their houses with memorabilia. Um, yeah. Any others? Man, that's a talkative group. Good. Have you ever worked with anyone trying to rebuild a uh, 38 model at full scale? Never at full scale, but a couple of those aforementioned yachts that were built in the 1930s, I've had people contact me that own them now, and they want to return them to the original appearance as much as possible. 
So, so for a number of those yachts, we have they had photographers come in and do professional interior photography of the entire thing. So then they can go back and replicate everything but the god awful floral patterns on the wicker furniture because it had a nice sun deck on the back, basically like a boat equivalent of a screen a screen porch. It hang out there. Um, that's what's happened the most. So one, I know I had one out of Wilmington or Wilmington, South Carolina, or North Carolina, that's doing that, um, or they're reconstructing parts of it. So like several of the museum ships around the Great Lakes may need the plans to reconstruct something. Can I, I would love to reproduce one of these 500 foot passenger liners, but that's not within my budget. Anymore? <laughs> Yeah. Well, the best thing we can do is uh, we create something called a finding aid. So that's basically like an online inventory of each collection that's within it. And then it has also has some brief history on the person or the company, what kind of stuff is in the collection. Um, and there's plenty of things that aren't. And that's the hard part because it's like it's like keeping up with because I think during COVID, more people were stuck at home and realized that they had stuff they didn't want anymore. So they're like, hey, can I send you this? Sure, sounds great. Um, that's the best thing, best thing for those. And then for individual things like books or pamphlets or something, we use the library catalog for that. So people can search and find them. They all get an individual number. So yeah, it's ongoing. The field as a whole, like archivists in general having the same problem. Have some pre-written questions here. Oh, one of them uh, is Great Lakes researchers found three shipwrecks this past summer in Lake Superior. Yeah, uh, isn't that unusual? Uh, yeah, generally because it's a big time commitment because you have to do a lot of research to narrow down what your search area is going to be. Then you've got to have the people with the funding and the boat because you got to have gas, you got to pay for food, you got to pay for any licenses that you may have um, for the equipment. Um, this, that one was specifically because it was, uh, several groups working together. I knew a couple people who were involved in it, so they had to pool a lot of money together and to do the time because you have to set the area and then you have to do what's called mowing the lawn. So that's, yeah, you turn on the side scan sonar to a specific width, and then you follow a pattern like this until you find or not find something and you can check it off your, you stick the coordinates in your GPS and then you go back later and investigate what you thought the hits were. Um, so they did, yeah, they did really well. And the technology is getting so good. And I actually got my first taste of doing side scan this summer in the Milwaukee River. And some of the, the detail you can get now is just amazing. So as opposed to, I've met people who are in their 70s that started doing this in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, where they had to design all their own equipment. They did it, they built it all themselves. Um, yeah. The worst is the guy who still has a dot uh, printer attached to his side scan, so it actually prints out like the hole <laughs> on that really old continuous paper with the holes in the side. Yeah, I already had to explain to several undergrads that at work what that is and what a floppy disk is. So like that's the save button in Word, right? I'm like, yeah, that's why it's it's very anachronistic. Um, yeah, it is unusual to find that many at once in like such a short span. Because it's for most people, it's just the time because they're working. I mean, a lot of the people who do the shipwreck hunting, it's their hobby. Like they do it outside of already working. Like the younger guy I mentioned earlier who has the autopilot and everything, like he's a lineman during the night, like a third shift lineman working on electric lines. He's like, that's the only reason I have enough money to go. Because <laughs> um, he does ROV photography, drone photography, and he goes out in like March when the water's still 30 some degrees and no one else is around because it's extra clear. <clears throat> so there's gonna be a point in the future where there's no more to find, but especially in Lake Michigan, it's very sandy. So the shifting sands expose, like the record high lake level exposed more shipwrecks than had been around before. Um, but especially in Lake Superior, it's very rocky. It's super cold, even in the summer. Don't go sw swimming is not for the uninitiated there. I learned that the hard way. I'm used to Lake Erie that's like, 80 degrees. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I know someone else who found two ships over here last year. They're right next to each other. There's a lighthouse out on Spectacle Reef out in Lake Huron. It's a national engineering landmark because they actually like built it on the reef in the water. Um, but there's a shipwreck that ran aground there, a sailing ship, 
And then, then the Corps of Engineers is like, well, we want to build a lighthouse. So they just like drag the rack off the reef and put it in the water. And then another ship went down right next to it. <laughs> so like, there's actually a couple instances of that over in kind of like South Manitou Island. There's a, a ship back from the 1960s that ran aground there. And it's like over top of an older shipwreck. <laughs> like, that one sticks out of the water, right? Yeah, it still does. Uh, I was there in like 97 and there was a lot more to see. Now it's like, even if you see it on like street view, it's almost all white from all the bird poop because <laughs> the birds live in it now. Um, but it's a good dive because it's only 20, 30 feet. I can't dive. I'm just going by what people tell me. But there's so many great videos on YouTube of people who are take their GoPro down and do the shipwreck. So if you can't go yourself, you can. Uh, now there's people doing uh, you know thousands and thousands of photos of one wreck, doing the photogrammetry and creating a 3D model of it. And on occasion, they're able to get inside some too. So you can even see some of the interior spaces because especially in Lake Superior, the water is so cold and so deep that you can still see all the grains in the wood. There's no deterioration. There's no muscles on it. The muscles are the big issue now because the, the weight of them and then they're also excreting all their waste onto the lift racks too and they eat the metal. So, but they clear up the water. So bonus. <laughs> um, so that's a big thing for shipwreck hunters too, is they're trying to document these as much as possible because one day they won't exist anymore. At least in the Great Lakes, they'll last longer because it's fresh water. That was a long answer to your question. <laughs> Any others? Wow, you got lots of good questions. More questions? No further questions. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome.